Good afternoon, everybody. Um, okay, so th this is obviously an online lesson. I just want to, obviously, before I started, just to um, say these are unusual circumstances, but these are unusual times, and uh, um, I hope that you are all okay and, um, and being safe. Uh, settling into routines, uh, I think, is really, really important. Um, so, lessons continue, as usual. Um, although in a slightly different way, uh, and from home. I'm obviously contactable at the end of an email if you um, need to sp uh, speak to me about any aspects of, of today's lesson. Um, so let's, let's just push straight on, shall we? Uh, just a reminder before we um, start today's lesson uh, that today is the deadline for your essay number four, um, which clearly you are going to have to um, scan um, and then email it to me. Um, so uh, if you haven't already done so, and thank you to those of you who have already sent it to me, can you please make sure you do that um, today? Um, thank you very much. Okay, so uh, today's lesson is the changing role of women. Um, for uh, pretty much the first half of the uh, of the period that we're looking at. Um, so th we're focusing in on um, German women between 1871, which is obviously the beginning of the um, Kaiserreich or the Second Reich, all the way up to 1932, which was the last full year of the Weimar Republic. Uh, this is the um, a breadth study society topic, so make sure that you file uh, notes into that section of your folder. Quite a few sort of um, uh, business items before we actually start getting into the historical content. So um, we'll move on. Obviously, one of the factors, one of the, the, the great benefits of an online lesson on YouTube is you can pause me. You can't do that in class um, as much as you might want to, uh, but you can pause me. So at, at any point, if I'm going too fast, just obviously um, click pause on YouTube. OK, all the materials for this lesson, um, the, the PowerPoint, everything is on a Padlet page, which I have um, emailed you the link to. So hopefully you've downloaded and printed off the mind map um, and um, uh, the, the notes for the lesson uh, and all the follow, follow up scans are, are in the Padlet folder as well. Um, so um, first, three reminders, a brief reminder, one um, about the mark scheme indicative content and the examiner reports, which are really useful. OK, um, uh, release yourself from dependence on class notes and the textbook. And remember, there's some excellent resources um, out there. And in particular, the mark schemes, indicative content and the examiner's report. OK, so um, here is an example of what you can get if you go to the mark schemes and uh, for, the, for the different papers. This is actually the 2018 paper. So it's nothing to do with women. It's a topic that we covered in the um, one of the previous lessons. I think it was actually the last lesson. How far do you agree that the number and the significance of white collar workers grew steadily in the years 1871 to 1990? That was in, um, on the 2018 paper. So you go to the mark scheme for that particular paper and you can access all the mark schemes. They're on the folder on the website and I'll come to that um, in a moment. And um, go past the generic mark scheme near the back of the mark scheme. You'll find um, the, um, what we call the indicative content. Um, so here we've got the indicative content uh, for that particular question. Um, and what it usually does is it gives you arguments and evidence that support the statement um, uh, in the question. In this case, the statement is uh, the number and the significance of white collar workers grew steadily. And then you've got um, on the flip side, you've got the, the counter argument. Um, again, uh, information. Now, it's the great pains to always say in the indicative content that this is not a mark scheme. It is just an indication of the type of content that the examiner would be looking for, but nevertheless, very, very useful for you when you're making notes. OK. Moving on. Then you've got the chief examiner's reports. Uh, so. Um, the paper has been examined three times in 2017, 2018 and 2019. And the great thing about the chief examiner's reports is they 
scan typical answers. Um, uh, they often scan good answers to the particular question at hand. So this is from the same paper, 2018, that question we just looked at about the white collar workers. Um, and as you can see at the beginning, they have a little bit of blurb. Okay, marginally the most popular of the Section C questions. This attracted some well-informed responses, blah, blah, blah. So this is the question about the white collar workers and they've scanned um, um, a response. Um, the rough plan and then the actual answer. Now, sometimes they only um, include part of the answer. Sometimes they include, they scan the whole of the answer. Okay, but nevertheless, very, very useful because you can actually read the answer. I mean, this isn't a very messy one, not very good handwriting, but yeah, encouragingly, read on. And then at the end of it, you're told what it got, certainly in terms of the level. And this actually achieved um, a level five Okay, and level five is basically an A star response. So it's a, let's say, a well informed response, covers the time frame very thoroughly, and you're given a little comment by the, uh, by, by the examiner. So use these um, scanned answers when you make notes as well. Okay, um, make sure you go through all the past papers, um, all the questions, and you read the scanned answers, and you use the information, and you look at the structure, and you add. Um, to your notes for whatever the topic may be. So, with that in mind, and we looked at white collar workers there, what about today's topic, the changing role of women, um, which is again part of Brett Study Society. It's a big part of social change. Okay, so there was, um, um, if you actually go to the second specimen paper, which again, you've got that, um, that's already there in the folders on, on um, the website. Um, and also the actual 2017 paper, you've got this, um, you've got um, questions there. So you can look at the indicative content, certainly for the 2017, 18, 2017 paper, you can look at the uh, chief examiner's report as well. Okay, no chief examiner's report for a second specimen paper because no students actually sat at it, um, obviously. So moving on. So from the second specimen paper, you've got this question. To what extent was the First World War a turning point in the changing role of women in Germany in the years 1871 to 1990? So again, as you can see, the indicative content breaks it down, first of all, into arguments and evidence that the First World War was a key development. Just zooming in so you can see that. So there is the type of information they were looking for. Very good information. Um, much of that information is not in the textbook. It's additional information. So you should be using this to make notes. Then you've got the counter argument that the First World War was not a key development in the change in the role of women, 1871 to 1990. So again, zoom in on that, and you've got counter arguments, okay, that present opposite points of view. Notice how, it, notice how at the bottom it says there, other relevant material must be credited. Okay, so very, very useful. And then the actual 2017 paper, okay, the same. Um, here is a, the question that was set in 2017. Uh, the role of women in the workplace was the most important change in their position in German society during the period 1871 to 1990. So you've got the argument and evidence that the role of women in the workplace was the most important change. So again, there are the key points. Again, you can pause the video and read these yourself. And some of those you'll be immediately you should be, be able to engage with those already because um, certainly by the end of today's lesson we'll be halfway through the period. But the uh, the latter ones uh, from there onwards we ha won't actually cover until we we get to those lessons. And then the counter argument that other that there were other aspects about the importance of women in society. 
that were more important than the workplace. So again, have a quick read. It wasn't just about women in the workplace. There were other things, the legal position of women, educational opportunities, welfare benefits, cultural opportunities, um, and the enfranchisement, the vote. Okay, so hopefully this is giving you a sense of, um, of, of where you can, of how you can use um, the indicative content to get to get a lot of useful information. Okay, so from the chief examiner report from the two thousand and seventeen paper, same question we just looked at. It tells you that that was a popular question which produced a wide range of responses the con the strongest candidates identified a range of criteria alongside the issue of the workplace follow the developments sometimes progress sometimes regression keywords contextual knowledge was very strong in the best answer so it tells you they're looking for contextual knowledge um, the weaker responses tended to be narrow in range and often confined to post-1918 or even post-1933. So pretty much it's telling you there, with this breadth study question, you must cover the whole of the 120-year period because weak responses are narrow in their range. So you're learning new stuff. And there is a scanned response, which you can read in your own time. It's on the, it's, remember, this is the PowerPoint for the lesson. So you can download the PowerPoint, read it, Now, in this particular case, that is a level four response. It could be better. It tells you why it got level four, not level five. It sustained a focus on the issue of women in the workplace. Very sound coverage of the time frame. So it covered the 120 years. Some effective deployment of knowledge. Other factors are dealt with to some extent. So it obviously covers things like education, culture, etc. Um, but um, the other factors needed to be stronger to move into level five. And there's the examiner's tip. Candidates need to ensure that key, de key stages in development are explained as well as illustrated. OK, so um, in other words, explain it, analyze it. OK, don't just describe it. OK, so there's aspects of narrative of description in that particular answer. OK, not a, not a weak answer but it could have been a better answer. So just a reminder that uh, all, all of the um, question papers and mark schemes and uh, and uh, chief examiner's reports um, can be accessed on the website, on your website. Um, this particular screenshot, it's, sorry, it's from the 2020. It's the one I use for my current year, um, 13. Yours is 2021, but I think I'm pretty certain the pages are the same. Uh, and it's the course information checklists. It's page nine uh, to um, to do that. I don't think on the PowerPoint I've, I've updated the uh, link. So w when you click there, it, that link probably won't work. But you, you, you obviously go to that website, your website all the time. So uh, that's where you can access it. OK, then continuing on the same theme, where else can you go? So we've looked at mark schemes with indicative content we looked at chief examiner's reports there are also lots of modeled answers okay a in the textbook okay um, and b in the revision guide um, so um, if you go to the um, your checklist of 106 um, possible questions okay as you can see the breadth study social change that page towards the back and look at the list of questions you got there um, the first one okay is referring you to the textbook page 37 where there is a model answer to the question the position of women in German society has shown little change okay and then the sixth question That's referring you to the revision guide by Alan Farmer. There's a model answer to that particular question. 
um, consistent advance in the rights and opportunities of women in Germany and West Germany um, on page 90 to 91. And that actually got a level five. So it was a very, very strong answer in the Alan Farmer uh, revision guide for you to look at there. OK, and um, other guidance, I've highlighted some other ones there for you, but they're, they're actual model answers on those particular um, pages. OK, so there you are, I've taken a, a screenshot. Um, that's the question. Uh, this is um, in the uh, revision guide, the Alan Farmer revision guide. So there's the question. To what extent did the years 1871 to 1990 see a consistent advance in the rights and opportunities of women in Germany and West Germany? And as you can see, um, it's, it's annotated. Um, so um, each paragraph has got a commentary about why it is a strong, um, about what actually makes that a strong paragraph. OK, so read the paragraph, look at what's said. Um, and think about why it is a strong paragraph. And then at the end, you're clearly told it is a level five essay. OK, so it is a very, very strong answer. So you've got really the material, much of the material you need, the information. So go through that and extract information uh, from that. OK, so as you can see, um, developments for women, it, is clearly a very commonly assessed topic with lots and lots of material there. And if you actually look at the um, questions uh, on, in, in your booklet of 106 questions, um, so you go to the Brett Study Society, um, it is either assessed directly, so you can see where, where I've got the green boxes, that is a direct question for you um, about the position of women in German society. All of those are about the role of women, okay, um, all of them. And either there are model answers or there is guidance, okay, there is um, uh, guidance for you, okay, or a model answer. So a great deal of information in the textbook. Uh, and in the revision guide, or if they've got blue boxes, somewhere in that answer you would need to be talking about women, okay? Because these are questions generally about social change, okay? Um, uh, was Germany a fairer society? Um, uh, increased social mobility. Um, those are all um, even the last one, it's actually saying, was the role of women in the workplace the most important change? It's actually, you could be saying, well, actually, there were more important changes for white collar workers or whatever. So that's a more general, uh, an indirect one as well. So um, basically, what, what all this is coming down to, this is a key topic that almost certainly you will be talking about in the exam. So you need to know it well. So. Uh, just as a reminder, hopefully you all have, have you purchased the Alan Farmer Revision Guide? Um, if not, make sure you um, get hold of it. Um, it's on Amazon. Um, you can buy it at any point. Um, and obviously it's an opportunity to remind you that you should be using those checklists, remember, to sketch out model answers, sketch out um, planned plans to um, all the particular questions. Um, that could possibly appear on the paper. And that's an ongoing task, chipping away at week by week. And obviously, now that we're in a self-isolation regime, it's a great opportunity to really get into that, isn't it? I mean, you've got more time, in a sense, because you're working from home, so you can set yourself a daily target to do a little bit each day. OK, so there we are. So that's by means of a, an introduction. It took 20 minutes, but uh, that covers uh, about half of the slides um, in the slideshow. So let's get into this topic, the changing role of women. So as I said, um, you, hopefully you've got your mind map in front of you. Um, you printed it off. <clears throat> I would, if I were you, uh, if, if you haven't, hopefully you'll have, you might have some A3 paper, 
and you can stick the mind map into the middle of it which gives you the space to map stuff around the edge if you haven't got a3 paper just stick sell tape together two sheets of a4 and then stick the mind map into the middle of that so you've got a, a big canvas to make notes around the edge um, so um, and hopefully you've got the class notes printed off and ready so just as we would in a lesson we'll head off um, the difference is you can obviously pause um, the video um, so um, I, I won't read all the notes to you but I'll just give you clear I'll, I'll make it clear I'm about to move on to the next screen so that that uh, will be an opportunity for it to be paused Okay, now, first of all, the reading on this. Um, so there's our big picture. It's the third of a series of lessons um, that we've been doing. So we looked at the rural classes, then we looked at the middle classes and the working classes, and then we're looking at the role of women, okay, um, in this one. And the reading for it, um, let's say we've got Richard Evans, The Pursuit of Power. We've got Stephen Lee, um, The um, Bime of Republic. Um, but also there is some useful information in um, A History of Modern Germany by um, Kitchen and A Social History of the Third Reich by Grumberger. Um, so all of those extracts are on the Padlet page um, for you to be using. But let's just talk quickly about the first two because they're the best on um, women and there's some really good information you can be using. Okay. Oh, sorry. And before that, um, there is a Quizlet. So I've added you to the group. Um, so when you go into the 12B history group on Quizlet, you'll see that there. Um, 14 questions based on the Stephen J. Lee essay, How Extensive Were the Social Achievements of the Weimar Republic? And there's quite a bit about women in that particular essay. Okay, so uh, yes, Richard Evans, his book, The Pursuit of Power. Now, it's obviously about Europe, not Germany. Um, and it's obviously only up to 1914, but within that book, and I've, I've scanned the relevant sections, there are some really good um, sections that look at, um, the, within which he talks about the progression of women, about women's rights and how they developed in the 19th century. So there's um, a section called The Triumph of the Bourgeoisie, then another one called Nothing to Lose But Their Chains, another one The Gendering of Emotion, and then there's a really good extract, The Final Frontier, and especially pages 542 to 3. So that's excellent material. And then um, in Lee's book, The Weimar Republic, um, chapter 9 is called Social and Cultural Achievements. Now, it's not just about women, this chapter. It's about society in general and about culture in general. But within each of these essays... There are two essays there. You will find him talking about women's rights and the, the developments of women in the Weimar Republic. OK, so um, go to those. And notice also, um, it's a bit of a cheat, but you can go to my notes. I've uploaded my own notes to those to that chapter on the Padlet page. So, but yeah, it doesn't, doesn't replace reading it yourself. Read the essays yourself, but in terms of the note making, download my own notes to that. Okay, so there's the mind map. So as you can see, we've got six strands to go through, um, um, starting with the Kaiserreich, uh, 1871 to 1914. Okay, so let's get straight into that. And here we are in a nutshell. So what I'll do is I'll read in each case in a nutshell, and then the next two or three pages will be the detail, and you can pause and make your mind you do your mind mapping okay so in a nutshell the new german empire created in 1871 ensured that prussian attitudes okay towards women continued into the newly created um, germany which as you know was the case uh, we've done that at how how germany was in many ways prussia enlarged so What's the relevant point? Well, Prussia, remember, was a very militarised society. The army was very important. So Prussia as a society had a strong sense of hierarchy, of order, as an army does. And therefore, within Prussia, which made up 60% of Germany, but these values were passed on to the whole of the German Empire after 1871, the status of women was very much lower than that of men. 
and that was actually enshrined in the legal code of the Kaiserreich, of the German Empire. Uh, so the primary duty of women was maternal. It was, in other words, in the home. It was either to be a mother or to be a domestic worker. Um, they were pretty much barred from taking any part in public life, such as politics. OK, so um, it was unheard of, really, for women to be involved in political um, or public office. Um, likewise, the law of the German Empire ensured that women's rights within marriage were secondary to the rights of their husband. OK, so the husband was very dominant and that was enshrined in the German civil code. So that's in a nutshell. And you can pause here and make your notes. OK, so um, there's information about the status of women being very traditional, the hierarchy, the maternal care, denied a vote, restricted participation in politics. Um, so that's that section. And then you've got information about the Germany's national civil code and about the status of women within marriage. So I'm sure you'll pause here, but I'm going to just move on to the next page. OK, so that's that's that. OK, that's the information for the first strand. Um, so there's our summary page and we'll build that up as we go through, as we always do. So the next one is industrialization. OK, so again, in a nutshell, let's just go through the key points. So as we've, we've done about this, the uh, first and second industrial revolutions of the 19th century and how they impacted on Germany. So the industrial revolution in Germany resulted in some opportunities for women to enter the workplace, especially textiles. OK, um, but that was pretty much it. On the whole, the old attitude continued that women's primary place was in the home, domestic work. OK, so the many other aspects of the Industrial Revolution, iron production, railway production, etc., etc., you wouldn't see women in there. Um, but there was some change because women entered the workplace for textile production. Uh, the view continued okay so we're talking about that i haven't used that in the in the summary but there's that word of continuity um that the health of women should be protected because their role was the maternal role and here's a this very distinctive point you know it's very very specific to germany um, because much of what I've said so far would apply to other countries like britain okay but there was a strong sense that the maternal role of the woman to have babies or to look after the household to be the domestic worker was directly contributing to the strength of the nation and maybe that maybe the, the reason this is why it's a specific german thing is because germany was a new country only formed in 1871 okay so sort of like valuing it and nurturing and looking after this new thing that was formed and was so important uh, rather than other countries like britain where the country had, be, had existed uh, for hundreds of years. OK, so that's quite an important point. Um, then, as you know, in the 1880s, Bismarck passed through the Reichstag a series of laws that improved social welfare, looking after the work, the, the workforce. And remember, remember, we did that. That was part of his strategy of trying to kill socialism with kindness because his anti-socialist laws of 1878 um, didn't work. So. Looking after the industrial workforce is not specifically a woman topic, but obviously if women were working particularly in the garment trade, textiles, some aspects of those laws did benefit women. It was indirect, but nevertheless it's important. It's relevant for you to talk about if you're talking about social change. Um, but fundamentally, although there, was, there were some benefits, it didn't change society's attitude women were still regarded as being second-class citizens. So it was not a significant change, but nevertheless, it is a change that is worth mentioning. OK, so here's the details. So again, you can pause um, to make your notes. So there's the information about 
the garment making. Women were officially classified as semi-skilled. And this is the Bismarck bit. Okay, and it's really worth picking out those details and making sure you know them and add them to your work. So women did benefit from these things. Women were guaranteed six weeks of maternity leave. And an 11 hour working day was guaranteed to the workers. <laughs> to the, at the time that was seen to be generous. Um, women were not to be employed in the mining industry. Um, women were allowed more time off at lunch and on Saturdays so they could perform their domestic duties. Um, but the focus was still that the proper place for women was in the home, um, subordinate below the needs of men. Um, and the attitudes were generally negative, okay? Um, and believing that work worsened the health of women and in particular greater chance of infant mortality and therefore if women were not looked after it was a threat to the health of the nation so it needed to look after the women to keep the nation strong was the basic attitude okay so again you can pause pause if you wish i'm going to move on to the third strand pressure groups 1871 to 1914 okay so pressure groups as you can see there's quite a lot of information here to map lots of uh, strands going off it let's just go in in a nutshell what exactly do we mean by pressure groups so from the 1880s onwards a variety of pressure groups formed in germany we have done pressure groups before um when we did about the naval but the naval laws and belt politik and that lesson you may want to have a look at that do you remember we did about the agrarian league and the pan-german league um, the Colonial League, etc. So pressure groups are, are, are pretty much groups that form outside normal politics, working on the streets of Germany. Um, so they're not really campaigning in mainstream politics. They're not really sort of like working in the Reichstag. They're taking their message out with banners and marches and protest movements onto the streets. Um, usually because they believe there's no point in trying to campaign through normal politics, through um, through uh, political parties in, in, the, in the Reichstag. So women did form pressure groups that campaigned for an improvement of women's status and rights. And most of those pressure groups worked outside mainstream politics. Not all of them, but one exception was the SPD. Um, and they actually campaigned for the rights of women um, within normal politics. We know about the SPD growing. And obviously the SPD were a party that were, that were campaigning in general for the rights of the workers, the working classes. But the working classes included women. So therefore, the SPD did push through politics, through normal politics, for the rights of working class women. But therein lay the problem. OK, the pressure groups, there were many of them, were divided and they were often divided. Think of our social pyramid along class lines. Um, so some pressure groups like the SPD were campaigning for the rights of working class women, whereas many of the pressure groups were campaigning for the rights of middle-class women. And some of the pressure groups took an even more radical line, quite feminist in their approach. There was one called the New Morality. So although gains were made, on the whole, these improvements made little headway because of that fact that they, they were divided. There were too many of them. Um, so that's an important issue. Um, it's a little bit like the political left was divided between the SPD and the communists. If there had been a single united um, uh, political party to represent the working classes, then they might have made more headway. Well, it's the same sort of thing with women. There were multiple groups, but because they're often divided along class lines, it weakened um, the, the, the ability to achieve any real results. So basically, um, little headway before the outbreak of World War One. Now, oh yeah, I did, yes, okay, um, that, that makes sense. So um, uh, the main pressure group was the Society for the Protection of Women Workers' Interests. 
Okay, so the names of the people are really important. She was um, that group formed in 1885 was led by Emma Era. Okay, tells you what their focus was. Had more than a thousand members. Banned by the government in 1886, so that was Bismarck's time. Um, Emma Era became the first and only woman elected to the General Commission of German Trade Unions. Um, and then you got the section about the SPD campaigning for women. Uh, and obviously Rosa Luxemburg, you will know of, because she um, broke away and formed the Spartacists with Karl Liebknecht. Um, but the other key one you really do need to mention is Clara Zetkin. Um, so um, she actually formed a woman's newspaper called Equality. And she founded the first ever International Women's Day, which was on the 19th of March, 1911. And there's a, um, a photograph of Clara Zetkin. Tells you a little bit more about her there. Um, so you can add that information to your notes. So they're the key ones to talk about. So um, uh, a, a range of, uh, of, of different points that, that are there. So um, which, which are the sort of key ones? Um, the Bund Deutsche, the Union of German Feminist Organisations, that was founded in 1894. Interestingly, I found a, um, a, an image there of a commemorative stamp formed 100 years later and published in Germany in 1994 com commemorating that particular group. Um, Federation of German Women's Associations formed in 1894 as an umbrella organisation. I skipped a page there. There's the page we looked at a second ago. Uh, which you can um, need to mention. So the the, um, the BDF, as it was known, formed in 1894. That was an organisation primarily for women, for middle class women, and the Federation of German Women's Associations also formed in 1894. By 1914, a quarter of a million members. So sort of definitely a, a, a blossoming and an expanding movement. And, and not just purely Germany, because obviously at the same time, if you go to Britain, this was the time of the suffragettes. <coughs> so these were universal developments that were happening in other countries at the same time. Um, <coughs> so I'm going to go back. Then you've got the radical feminist organisations. Um, and this information is what, what, is what we've taken from Evans. Um, uh, and interesting information there. OK, so have a quick look through that. Um, so a radical wing emerged led by Marie Stritt, the d daughter of a Reichstag deputy, campaigned publicly against state regula regulation of prostitution. She sued the police, forced the topic to be debated in the Reichstag. OK, um, presumably through her father, who was the Reichstag deputy, but on the whole unsuccessful. Then you've got the German Union for Women's Suffrage, formed by a lawyer, Anita Augsburg and Linda Heyman, um, based in Hamburg, where it was legal to attend political meetings. And then a very interesting one, and there's a picture of her here, Helena Sturker. She formed what was called the New Morality Movement. It pushed for legal equality for unmarried mothers and illegitimate children, pushed to legalise abortion and free contraception. Um, that new morality movement was, however, opposed by more traditional women's groups who were shocked um, that uh, about the sort of modernness of these ideas, very shocked. These ideas were too, far too unconventional. Um, and ironically, the, the new morality movement, Helen Sturker, um, it broke apart because of internal divisions, um, including many of her members, who were accused of sleeping with men in order to win Reichstag votes, as that was pointed out by uh, Evans in his extract. Uh, so, again, in German circles, Helen Sturker is quite an, a well-known person. So, again, a good one to mention if you're writing about women in Section C in the exam. OK, so we're halfway there, doing well. Um, and let's move on to the next, the final three strands. OK, so ideological confusion in a nutshell. OK, so this is the year 1914. Let's take stock of where we are. On the eve of World War One, the women's movement was weakened by internal division. So we've already said that. So 
an example of this. Middle class women in Prussia, because remember Prussia was 60% of Germany and it had its own political system within Germany. And remember Prussia had that voting system, that three-tier system where um, the, uh, the, the vote of an upper class person counted for three, a middle class person counted for two and a working class person counted for one. So middle class women in Prussia were happy to fight for women to have the same rights as men in Prussia. But that, of course, is not fighting for equality because they're simply saying we want the three tier system to be applied to women as well. Whereas working class women in Prussia would have argued that that was the wrong approach, that you shouldn't be fighting to have the same rights as men. You should be fighting to overturn the system and introduce a whole new system in which one man, one vote, one woman, one vote. OK, um, so working class women would have argued that the above would give more power to middle class women, but not working class women. And therefore, working class women pushed for universal adult suffrage, um, which was different from the middle class, the, 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 uh, the women's organisations <coughs> um, that were representing the middle class women. Uh, and then there were also many right wing women's groups who argued against change. Um, um, there were as many. We said a minute ago that um, the new morality movement was opposed by many women's groups. Okay, and there were many traditional, very conservative women's groups who actually believed that the existing system in which women were seen to be second class and their role was based on the uh, the, the the home, the domestic role, should be retained. Um, they be believed that the, that it was essential to keep the existing unequal system. So, uh, not all women were pushing for change. So that's that in a nutshell. And there is a summary. OK, and again, that's where I've re referenced it there. If you look at the Evans, um, page 543, um, he, he's very good on that. So you read that and I've actually found a little quote for you, which you could learn. German feminism, despite its outward appearance of strength, had become ideologically confused, weak and divided by the eve of the First World War. And he makes those three points. OK, notice that last one about cons the conservative women who attacked the feminists. The, so this group of conservative women believed in traditional family values. And many of these women followed social Darwinist ideas. OK, remember the law of nature. Um, women's primary role was a natural role to bring up children. And it's no coincidence that many of those women, the conservatives, that didn't want women's role to change uh, were backers of Hitler and the Nazis. And of course, Hitler and the Nazis were the ultimate social Darwinists, believing in the values of the law of nature and the, the law of the jungle. OK, so again, you, you presumably will pause at this point to make your notes, but I'll keep moving. And now our fifth strand, the impact of one. OK, so in a nutshell, on the whole, women supported World War One, OK, including SPD women, including working class women, for the same reason as men. So Bergfrieder, OK, so at the beginning of the war, the on the whole, women backed the war because Bergfrieder was they believed it was a just defensive war. There were, however, significant exceptions with the minority of women, including Rosa Luxemburg, who opposed the war from the very beginning. OK, so can't make blanket statements. Most women supported the war, as did most men. But there were people from the beginning, including women such as Luxemburg, who opposed the war. Next point, as with other countries, think about Britain, what you know about women in Britain during the war, the war did give women opportunities to show that they could contribute to the country's economy by working in factories, munitions factories, etc. Um, and that also increased their sense of social, their, their social image, their sense of self-confidence. It, it gave them more confidence. They could see themselves as being essential for the nation's survival. So when the war ended in 1918, uh, the attitude of women towards themselves was different. They they saw we can do the same as men we can contribute the same as men to the nation 
uh, and that's why, as in Britain, um, after the war, in the, within 10 years in Britain, women had got the vote, same vote as men. Well, it actually happened even quicker in Germany because, of course, there was the German Revolution of 1918 to 1919, the fall of the monarchy and the birth of the Weimar Republic. And significantly, um, women secured the, the equal vote with men um, when the new constitution was published in August 19, 1919. The old civil code of the, of the, the Kaiserreich, the German Empire, was abolished. Women's rights were guaranteed by the Weimar constitution. And that was nine years ahead of Britain. Um, Britain, women didn't get their right to an equal vote until 1928. So um, huge change for women um, at the end of World War One, uh, the beginning of the Weimar Republic. So that's it in a nutshell. So again there's plenty of detail there which you need to add to the mind map. Okay so a um, bit of information uh, there uh, um, there's a picture of Rosa Luxemburg okay there uh, the beginning, there's information about um, the minority of women who were rejected the SPD policy of supporting the war, so they didn't believe in Bergfrieder. So the best examples are um, Clara Zetkin, who we mentioned earlier. She was the one who organised the International Socialist Women's Anti-War Conference. Um, both Luxembourg and Zetkin were frequently arrested for opposing the war. And then, of course, Luxembourg joined the Spartacists and she was murdered in, in January 1919 during the Spartacist uprising. Um, then there's some information about the economic impact on the role of women, the fact that they had previously been barred from working in anything other than textile in trades, but now they took up um, positions in lots of other sectors, the postal sector, the transport sector, um, having to fill the jobs vacated by men. And again, there's some useful statistics. So Bosch, we know about Bosch in Stuttgart, increased with the number of women it employed <coughs> tenfold, um, nearly tenfold. But at the end of the war, notice they had to give their jobs back to the men. Um, but between 1907 and 1925, female labour increased by one third. So again, useful information for you to learn to include in USA's. And then there's the point about social gains, newfound sense of freedom, um, greater conf confidence in themselves. I'm moving on to the next slide. And then some good information here about the political impact. So the new Weimar constitution granted all women the vote, um, encouraged the participation of women in politics. Uh, nearly 10% of the newly elected Reichstag members um, were women. And that's in contrast. Think about uh, Britain. Um, we all know about Mary Astor. She was the only one. You know, we remember her because she was the only one. Actually, 10% of the new Reichstag members were women in 1919. And it remained around about 6 to 7% throughout the whole of the Weimar era. One-tenth of all locally elected bodies were women by the late 1920s. Notice how much lower it was in Britain and the USA. And there's the point about the old civil code of the Kaiserreich replaced by the guarantees of the Weimar Constitution. Um, and can I just remind you there, C. Stephen J. Lee. Okay, um, Those essays include some really good information. It actually tells you the article numbers that guarantee the rights of um, women. There's one there, Article 109, gave all women the vote. But there's further details in Lee to pick up. Uh, membership of the BDF that we've already mentioned grew from 300,000 to 900,000, nearly a million by the end of the 1920s. Moving on. Okay, so we're building up a picture. We've covered five of the six strands. The last strand. Okay, so developments for women during the Weimar Republic. Okay, so uh, 19... 18 through to 1932. Now, obviously, we've covered the key time blocks of the Weimar Republic. You know about that. Years of crisis, 1919 to 23. Um, the kind of like years of recovery, 1924 to 28. And then obviously 1929 to 32 is the impact of the Great Depression, um, plunging 
um, um, unemployment and political instability, loss of confidence in the democracy, etc., etc. So it's understanding how uh, women's um, rights changed um, in that particular context. So in a nutshell. Although women's rights and status in the new Weimar Republic continued to make significant progress, so there's that point about continuity, so improvement did continue, key feature was that women as a group became polarised, okay? Um, so uh, the move to the poles, okay? There was a move to, for much greater equality for many women, but many women opposed that change. So many women grasped those opportunities that the Weimar Republic gave them. Um, they were very active in politics, as we've seen, seven, six to seven percent um, in the Reichstag, um, actively participating in culture. We'll come on to some examples in a minute, and in the economy, in the workforce. Okay. Now, in part, that was because there were two million more women than men in the Weimar Germany because. So many German men died in the First World War, <coughs> which in a sense forced women to become more active. They had to. Um, there were many women who were single, um, were not married because of uh, um, surplus women to men. And so um, a single working mums or sing, sing, single, um, single women entering the workplace, but also um, many widows, um, many women have been widowed during the war and they were single mothers. They had to go out into the workplace. So that's one side, OK? But on the other hand, counter counterpoint of view, many German women reacted strongly against these developments. We've talked about the conservative women, um, the ones who latched onto social Darwinist ideas that and they genuinely passionately believe women should stay in the home. Okay. The, the, the strength of this new country born in 1871 was dependent upon them being in the home. Uh, and they, they, they were still there in the Weimar era. Um, so they continued to exist a strong conservative reactionary element. Remember they used reactionary. They wanted to turn the clock back to the way it had been earlier. They didn't like modern women who were going out into the workplace taking part in politics. So they opposed many of the gains that women had achieved in the Weimar era. And these reactionary women uh, viewed the new modern Weimar woman as a metaphor for the breakdown of traditional family values. And so when the democratic system began to fall apart, particularly after 1929 with the Great Depression, and clearly the country was was breaking down and um, democracy wasn't working, coalition governments couldn't solve the problems. So the decline of law and order, um, many of these sort of um, uh, conservative reactionary women sort of saw the new modern Weimar woman as a sort of metaphor for the failure of democracy. And it's no coincidence, as I said earlier, is that these um, reactionary women were often were very active in supporting and voting for the Nazi party. And that's the theme we'll pick up. So there's a sort of um, picture of a, a typical sort of um, the new Weimar woman. OK, very modern. I mean, very, um, by the standards of the day. So make a note of that. Put that. Um, um, it's a bestseller. It was a book. Vicky Baum's Stude Chem Helene Wilfers draws uh, the idea of the new woman. Um, so she was a... a um, a female student in the heavily male dominated sciences you can see she's a scientist and but a woman like who dressed like a man who looked like a man um in a man's world okay and that was in many ways the sort of like typical image of what weimar women many weimar women looked like um uh, and lots of information there okay about socially confident um, urbanized they went to live in the towns sexually active very much influenced by america the american lifestyle they went to nightclubs etc they liked listening to jazz uh, because remember the doors plan was bringing in lots of american influences into the country at the time so there is that the book we just said um, a best-selling novel of 1929 but there's the reaction by the conservative German women who didn't like that. He saw it as challenging traditional family structures. And many Weimar women supported the Nazi rise to power because they they they, they believed that the Weimar Republic was, was tainting, was dirtying, in a sense, um, the traditional role of women. Moving on. 
And again, there's another sort of typical picture, um, very famous film made in, I think it was 1931, called Blue Angel. Um, Marlena Dietrich became an international film star um, when Hitler took power, or in the early 1930s, I'm not sure the exact date, yeah, she went to America, she fled She fled Germany to escape the Nazis and went to live in America. She became a big American star, starring in American westerns and so on in the 1950s. Um, but her career began in the Weimar Republic, Marlena Dietrich. Um, and that's where her most famous film, um, The Blue Angel, about nightclubs in um, Berlin. Um, and as you can see, this sort of uh, image you have of women there, you know, living like men, drinking by themselves, living that sort of independent life. Um, so very liberating, very um, motivating for many, many German women, but at the same time, uh, an equal number of women almost reacted against it, the reactionary uh, movement um, against it. So traditional roles uh, persisted. Okay, so again, I'll, if you want to pause it, to sort of like do your note making, but I'll move on here. So there is our big picture. Okay, we've sort of covered all of those points in this lesson, and now um, let's talk about the next two lessons. What we're going to do next week. So, um, as you know, we our, ne our next topic is going to be to move on to the third depth study which is called A New Reich, 1933 to 35. So it's obviously about the rise to power um, and the first three years of Hitler in power. Obviously, the Third Reich continued until 1945, but the specification says we look in detail at the first three years, the sort of foundation and consolidation of Hitler's Germany, the early years of it. OK, so... As you can see, our friend Evans, now you've been using his book, which is The Pursuit of Power, which is about 19th century Germany. He is most well known for being a specialist on Nazi Germany. And he, um, 10 years or so ago, he published three books. The first was called The Coming of the Third Reich, which is about the Third Reich, um, the, 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 the rise to power of Hitler. The second was called The Third Reich in Power. And the third was called the Third Reich at War, in other words, World War Two, And they're generally regarded as sort of like masterworks, really, the best books written about Nazi Germany. Um, although, you know, the, the, um, the picture is still, <laughs> you know, new books are emerging. I mean, there's been a, another superb biography of Hitler by a historian called Volker Schlondorf uh, that has been published recently. Uh, son of Volker Schlondorf, Volker Ulrich, um, published recently, um, which uh, is is uh, another one which I'll mention at a later stage. Okay, so we're going to do two lessons, um, prepare, preparation really, uh, before we launch into Germany in 1933. We need to get our heads around the key sort of issues um, that are relevant to understanding who the Nazis were and the rise to power of the Nazis. Okay, so for Monday's lesson, um, I'll I'll um, put the scanned pages onto the Padlet page for you. I want you to read pages two to seven of the opening chapter of his second book. That's the one called The Third Reich in Power. So book one is all about Hitler's rise to power, but he begins the second book, The Third Reich in Power, with a prologue in which he sums up his first book. Okay. And he does it very neatly. Um, and I want you to read pages two to seven, because pages two to seven provides an overview of the key features of German history from 1871 to 1932. He doesn't really talk about Hitler in this in this section. But what he does do is he he he, he gives for the uninitiated and you're not. You, you've been studying this, so you should cope with it fine. But he provides a, a very useful summary over um, six or seven pages about Germany between 1871 to 1932. Okay, so he looks at in six paragraphs. So the first paragraph, um, he looks at Bismarck's Germany strengths, then he looks at Bismarck's Germany weaknesses. Okay, so very useful revision for you. This 
Then his third paragraph, he looks at World War I, the spirit of 1914. And he then, in paragraph four, looks at the first four years of the Weimar Republic, the time of the Cat Putsch and you know, the, 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 uh, the hyperinflation, etc. And then he, in his fifth paragraph, he looks at the Weimar Republic in general and he looks at the sort of idea of social fragmentation. We've touched upon that in this lesson. Women, for example, um, you know, taking opposite points of view. Cultural disorientation. Again, we've touched on that this lesson, you know, about um, cultural life and literature and films and how new, very modern things were being produced, such as the... Um, the, the the book that we looked at earlier about the chemist um, but a reaction against that type of literature and the same with films and art etc and of course political weakness that you already know about okay the uh, um, the Weimar constitution looked perfect in theory but in reality it led to weak government because you had coalitions and obviously it then all became evident in 1929 when the Great Depression hit and everything fell apart and the government's couldn't um, um, resolve the issues okay and so generally the people turned against democracy which leads to his final paragraph about the violence and the rise of the extreme right wing so in in monday's lesson make, yeah, make sure you've read all that beforehand think about those six paragraphs as you read it all i ask you to do is to read it okay thinking about those paragraphs and what they're saying and then in the lesson we'll go through the key points uh, from that and then in the next lesson, which I think is Wednesday next week, we will look at the next section of that prologue. And in the next section of the prologue, um, basically, um, Evans, having kind of like talked about Germany in general between 1871 and 1932, then starts talking about the Nazis. OK, and it's a very, very useful summary. He summarises all the key points with regards who Hitler was, who the Nazis were, the NSDAP, up to the moment when Hitler was appointed Chancellor on the 30th of January 1933. And there are seven paragraphs which explore the following broad themes. So again, they're numbered there. So that will help you. So for Wednesday's lesson, you need to read pages 7 to 11, and you need to think about the seven paragraphs. So the first paragraph looks at Hitler and the Nazi party. The second paragraph looks at the economic impact of the Great Depression. The third paragraph, the political impact. The fourth paragraph, who supported the Nazis. So again, you know about that, white collar workers, rural classes, um, conservative women. OK, so a lot of this will be pulling together what you all, you've already picked up from um, early lessons. Uh, the fifth paragraph looks at the dynamic appeal of Nazism. And that's kind of like looking more at what did the Nazis do that made them so attractive. It's the propaganda um, approach and so on. And then the sixth and seventh paragraphs pretty much focus in on the sort of political manoeuvrings that resulted in Hitler being made chancellor. Because remember, Hitler was made chancellor at a moment when the Nazis were losing votes. So manipulated into power by the army. Um, so the army engineered the fall of Chancellor Bruning um, in the summer of 1932. And then the next cha two chancellors, von Papen, then Schleicher. Um, and what happened during their brief rules that led um, to Hitler becoming chancellor on the 30th of January 1933. So those two key lessons next week, what we're basically doing is we're looking at the rise to power of Hitler. It's strictly speaking not part of the Depth Study 3. It's setting up Depth Study 3, but you can't jump into Hitler in power without understanding who Hitler was and how he got there, uh, which is the purpose of those two lessons. So that's it. OK, that's the end of this um, of this video. Hopefully that was useful to you. Um, plenty for you to get on with. OK, um, uh, that's it. Sign off. I'll be um, back with you with another YouTube video on Monday morning. Thank you. Bye.